Right. Um, so thank you. So um, Alistair talked about our, our partition functions yesterday. So I'm also talking about partition functions, but maybe in more uh, sort of combinatorial um, view. So uh, I'm not sort of striving to get the most general definition, but uh, so for re reasonably uh, broad definition would be as follows. So suppose that we have a family of subsets, uh, some combinatorially defined family of subsets. Um, so, and uh, what we do, we associate a polynomial with it. So in principle, in n complex variables, so we take the sum overall um, subsets in the family and the product over um, elements in the subset of the variables, sort of a generating function. And uh, the reason we call it partition function, so what we want from it, so typically, so this is partition function. So uh, typically, in interesting situations, so this set, the family is pretty large. So, and therefore, so if it's a bad idea to try to write this polynomial explicitly as a sum of monomials. But on the other hand, it's sort of clearly defined. So checking uh, whether a particular subset in the family is, is immediate, is easy, right? Uh, and um, what we want to do, we want to compute maybe approximately uh, this polynomial uh, whenever we can. And of course there are questions of why, but that I'm planning to address only briefly later. The short answer is sort of it makes a living. Right. <laughs> right. So, so, so you can think of a good example as, a, uh, for example, if I have a graph and uh, with n edges, and the family is just a family of all uh, Hamiltonian cycles in the graph. So it's potentially it's a large family, but checking if any particular uh, set of edges form a, uh, form a Hamiltonian cycle is easy. And uh, we want to compute it whenever we can. So, all right, so that's the partition function as I like to think about it. So any objections to that? Right, so then uh, I'll be talking about the sort of relation of the <coughs> computational complexity of the partition function and its complex zeros. And I'd like to have one running example. So it's sort of my long held superstition that Whatever method you get, you should try it on the permanent. And if it doesn't give you anything new, then scrap it and just start thinking about something else. So what, what, what's the permanent? So uh, it was also introduced last time. So the matrix, we have a, a square matrix uh, A, A, I, J, um, and by N matrix. So the permanent of A is the sum over all our permutations for which there are n factorial of the products of the um, generalized diagonals. So it looks uh, like the determinant only simpler, so there are no signs. And it was introduced at the same 
in the same year, I think in the same paper as the determinant, uh, simultaneously by Binet and Cauchy in 1812. That was a fateful year in many respects. In particular, uh, the permanent uh, appeared. Right. So, okay, so again, so if we try to write it, so it sort of fits this general description. We know what a permutation is, right? And if we try to write it explicitly, it will take us a while, right? For even for moderate values of n. So um, then uh, I'd like to have a sort of um, to uh, start the description of the results. So I'll state two theorems. One is called theorem one and the other is theorem two. And I'll spend some time explaining why one implies the other. Uh, so theorem one. So let A be n by n complex matrix a complex matrix uh, such that all entries are within distance 0.5 from 1 all ij so, so the picture is as follows. So we have uh, entries in that disk around one. So then uh, the permanent of A is not zero. So uh, I'd like to uh, remark here that it should not be immediately obvious because if, for example, uh, all entries of the matrix are the same and just uh, line this circle uh, somewhere here, then the permanent is roughly n factorial times a to the n. So as this entry walks in the circle, it potentially can rotate n times, or almost n times, around the origin but it will never hit it, right? Because uh, when you rotate, so it first rotate n times one way, but then it will rotate n times the other way, so that the one in number will zero. So, and if at any point al already you got bored, I challenge you to prove it. It uses some middle school math. I will prove it at the end. And as you're doing it, I challenge you even further to improve that 0.5. Uh, I don't know if it's optimal. I know, for example, that square root of 2 over 2 cannot be put here, but which is 0.7 roughly. So that's theorem 1. Uh, theorem 2, will be implied by theorem 1. And it will say that as long as you tighten this condition a bit, then things become computable. So uh, for every n, um, every epsilon, say, between 0 and 1, uh, there is a polynomial. Uh, P of A, uh, which I understand as a polynomial in n squared matrix entries in Aij, uh, such that uh, the degree of P is uh, logarithmic. So is um, maybe I should just write. Uh, in O notation, where all implied constants here in O notation are absolute, right? And uh, uh, if I try to approximate the log of the permanent by that polynomial, it ends up being within 
absolute error epsilon provided uh, the matrix satisfies a slightly tighter condition, say the distance from one is at most point four nine for all ij's. Right. So basically the uh, the the essence of the interpolation argument is to explain how is first one uh, implies the second one. And um, uh, so, so this polynomial is not mysterious at all. So we'll compute it sort of explicitly or at least uh, give some uh, recipe for that. So it's computable in, again, uh, in uh, quasi-polynomial time. So P is computable. In, uh, n of log n minus log epsilon time. And uh, we had this uh, back and forth with Alistair yesterday saying that well, for me, quasi polynomial is just, just as good as polynomial. But um, if for you it's not, so then uh, I don't know how to make it polynomial. Okay, so, so, so the, the first goal, therefore, uh, will be to explain uh, this uh, implication. So any uh, objections to that? So that implication will sort of have some universal significance. So it really has nothing to do with the permanent. So, so the general principle here that I advertise is that uh, if uh, this partition function is non-zero in some complex domain, uh, in the Right, then it can be efficiently computed in a smaller domain, slightly smaller. Uh, the other thing that I have to say is that, so I'm taking the log and uh, I allow the matrix to be complex and this is all right because by this theorem I know that the permanent is non-zero so I can choose the uh, continuous branch of the log in a simply connected uh, domain of matrices that is fine, this required in all disk, right? So, Again, any, any objections? So do you also need some easy starting point in that domain? Or just well, sort of, right, but that's negligible, right? So what do we mean by easy? So you say it's easy, I'll say it's not. Another way. Yeah. But so it's, certainly it's not a theorem, right? It's a principle. So I'm allowed to be intentionally vague. Okay, so probably the better way to say it, not com computed, but nicely approximated by Taylor series in smaller. Well, way. we will see about that. So it starts with Taylor series, but then it will do something else. So, right. So it all. Uh, hmm? One I'm not sure. So permanent is complete for in a very formal sense. Maybe. Well, it is, but uh, I'm approximating it. So, and uh, of course, uh, I mean it's uh, known that it's a result of uh, Jerome Sinclair and Vigada that it's uh, approximable for non-negative matrices. It's approximable for some other matrices, in particular for this one. Right. Although I'm not claiming you compute it exactly, that still remains sharply hard because if you 
uh, compute it exactly in an open domain, then just by interpolation you can compute it exactly everywhere. Right, so it's all hinges on the uh, lemma, which is not much of a lemma, but as some people say trivial but useful remark. Right. So, so the lemma goes as follows. So uh, let uh, G be a univariate polynomial. of uh, degree n, and it so happens that uh, it's non-zero in a disk of radius greater than one. Centered at the origin for some uh, beta strictly greater than one. So the picture, again, is uh, we have a disk and uh, there are no zeros here, right? And uh, the radius is greater than one. So then what I can do, because again, it's a simply connected domain, I can take the log And it's an analytic functional right. And um, I will approximate it by Taylor series computed at zero. So I'll say that take the Taylor polynomial, just a series polynomial of degree m, <coughs> but um, compute it at uh, zero. And uh, what, I w what I want to do, uh, I want to uh, use this Taylor polynomial uh, to approximate uh, the value of that uh, function at one. And uh, I can do that, so if I try to approximate uh, the value at one, then I can write a bound so that does not exceed the degree n, right, uh, divided by beta to the m, uh, beta minus one, and a little factor of m plus one, not terribly important here. Uh, but what is important is that uh, to get error epsilon, Uh, it suffices to pick the polynomial of degree logarithmic in n and epsilon. Suffices to have uh, something like that. So m of the order of uh, beta certainly comes into play here, but also uh, log n and epsilon kind of coming in logarithmically, and that's the same log n as here, and that's the same log epsilon as there, right? So uh, this is it, right? And I'll prove it. So there is the null saying, it's not mine, that every talk should have one proof and one joke, and they better be not the same, but here it's uh, the, um, distinction is blurred, so the proof is a sort of a joke. Yeah, so it's an exercise, right? So proof, but I'll do it. Uh, so what, what happens here is that, uh, so it's a polynomial, right, so degree n, so we can uh, factor it. So g of z is g of zero, 
times the product of n factors 1 minus z over alpha sub i, where alpha 1, alpha n are the roots. So if they are the roots, then uh, we know that they don't lie in that disk. So therefore, uh, they have um, uh, the, the absolute value greater than beta. So right. I, can, I could have taken an open disk. It doesn't really matter. So then uh, what is f of z? So f of z, I take the log. And that's f of 0 plus the sum of logs of these fractions. And what do I know? I know that I know how to approximate log of 1 minus something as the by Taylor polynomial. So I'll say that, especially if I want to do it at 1. Right, so log of 1 minus 1 over alpha sub i, right, is what is the, um, if I write the Taylor polynomial, it will be this, plus uh, if I cut it, the Taylor series at m, so there will be error. And uh, you see these alphas are in the uh, denominator. So uh, the error is bounded by whatever I get from uh, the rest of this uh, series. And it decreases exponentially. So I can estimate it by. Uh, this. I can basically <coughs> bound it by geometric series. So the point is that the error for logs decreases exponentially. Uh, and then I just add up all errors and I get a, a, in the numerator, I get the degree of the polynomial. Right. So. Didn't do much. So any 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 objections? Okay. Uh, but you don't object, right? So okay. So then um, uh, I'd like to explain this um, uh, this. Um, implication, where do I do that? So, so have this board, right? So the implication. So what I do, I'll just define a polynomial. So g of z, univariate polynomial. So that would be the permanent. The polynomial interpolating between the permanent is something really simple. The permanent of the matrix filled by ones plus so z times uh, uh, the matrix A minus the matrix of all ones, right? So that uh, uh, what I want, I want. Uh, <coughs> The value at one, which is the permanent of the matrix. So what I know, so I know that if my matrix satisfies this tighter the condition, then by uh, theorem one, uh, which I didn't prove, but uh, intend to do. So uh, I have that G of Z not 0 if 
z does not exceed uh, the ratio 0 0.5 over 0.49, which I call beta, and which is greater than 1. Right, so if I know that my matrix, the entries, don't deviate by more than four, uh, 0.9, then if z is in that disk, so the entries of this matrix inside the permanent do not deviate from 1 by more than 0.5, and the uh, permanent uh, is not 0. Right. So then, of course, I use lemma and say that, so I define uh, the log, pick a continuous branch, standard one, I guess. So uh, for uh, Z in that disk, and uh, I'd like to approximate that log by the uh, Taylor polynomial. So I get that the value at 1, which is log of the permanent, is approximated by the Taylor polynomial of f at computed at 0 of degree m. Oh, at 1, I'm sorry, uh, Taylor polynomial 1. Um, so the Taylor polynomial starts off at 0, but I want its value at 1. Uh, does not exceed epsilon if uh, for some m equal logarithmic in n and epsilon, right? That I only need uh, logarithmically many terms. So my goal is basically to show that uh, this polynomial is essentially low degree polynomial in the entries of the matrix, which is uh, sort of easy. So, so need to show that this value is a polynomial of degree um, m, right. So we need to show that. So, and uh, I show that in two steps. So, so the first step One is uh, to show that uh, the derivatives of the polynomial at zero, which I will not use, but I use the derivatives of log of polynomials, and then to figure out that the derivatives of the log are also polynomials. So, what is the value of the case derivative at zero? So, if I honestly write, what am I doing here? So I differentiate k times the permanent, which is just the, uh, the sum uh, over all symmetric group of all permutations of the product, 1 plus z a i sigma of a i minus 1. And uh, well, it's easy to differentiate the sum, right? You just differentiate it. And it's a bit harder, but still doable to differentiate the product even of n terms. So, and uh, I, I wanted that z equals 0, which is essential. So, what I get, I get the sum over all ordered k tuples, right, of the products. Um, so, if I substitute. So a i1 sigma of i1 minus 1, a i k sigma of a i k minus 1, uh, and the sum, of course, over uh, all the symmetric group. But the point is that it's a highly symmetric expression. So uh, what it boils down to basically uh, boils down to um, some simple sum, so over two sets of ordered um, k tuples, right, with the um, trivial factor here, and what I get here is 
uh, the basically particular polynomial of degree uh, of degree k, right? So that uh, what I get at zero. So for the polynomial, but I do need um, uh, derivatives of the log. And I learned that as I go down, you can still see it on the side on side screens, right? So I'll go under. Yeah, so it's not that I'm doing something ulterior there, right? So you can still you can see it, right? So, so f prime, f is a log, f prime is g prime over g, so g prime is f prime times g. So if I differentiate k minus time, so I'll get a system of equations. So g, in the case derivative at zero, is the sum from j equal zero to k minus one, I guess, right? k minus one, choose j. And uh, here I have f uh, k minus j at zero j. J, J is zero. And um, as Alistair explained last time, uh, yesterday, so that's just a non-degenerate system, triangular system of linear equations. So from that, it follows that, and the step uh, two, it follows that uh, the logarithmic derivatives are also in the polynomial. degree uh, k in uh, aij. So that will be step two. And that uh, concludes the proof, so, right? So that's a connection. So I, I should say that um, uh, uh, undergraduate students um, uh, some time ago um, Max Kantorovich and Hanbu, so they performed their numerical experiments and they kind of told me that for matrices satisfying this condition, they checked 20 by 20 because that's where they could compare the answer with uh, what Maple gives, exact computation. So polynomials of degree three, they, they told me, give pretty good, uh, make, uh, do pretty good job like approximating within 1%, but for the log. 1% for the log. And they run it like for matrices up to 100, uh, but there they couldn't, of course, uh, t typically compare the answer with the correct one. So uh, why do I bring it up? Just to say that uh, unlike some other theorems, this theorem is true not only in general, but also in particular. So you can actually use it to compute. So, right. So, uh, so I suggest we we'll look at it for uh, uh, 40 seconds and uh, uh, see if there are any, any issues here. Any experiments with the constant 0.5? Yeah, so that turns out to be pretty hard because um, even for three by three matrices, so the maple already having hiccups. So, uh, so it's very easy to show that. So, so for example, the permanent of the matrix one plus i over two, one plus i over two, one minus i over two, one minus i over two is zero. So therefore, 0.5 cannot be replaced <coughs> by square root of 2 over 2, which is 0.7. Right. But, uh, and furthermore, uh, you can construct examples like this, that uh, Boris Book did, of an arbitrarily large size. So square root of 2 over 2 is there to stay. But a colleague of mine, John Stanbridge, um, found a matrix uh, which I call 
the gene matrix, so it's x, y, 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 x, y, 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 x, for some particular values, y and x, which say that 0.5, in this case, cannot be replaced by uh, 0.69. So, uh, but, but, but this one doesn't scale, so we don't know if there are analogs of it, like in higher dimension. So, in, in fact, we know nothing, oh, well, sort of, of what's on this board. So, for example, I don't even know if the exact constant should come with a strict inequality, non-strict. Yeah, for every particular n, of course, it should come uh, with a non-strict inequality, right? Because the variety is closed. But as n grows, so the inequality may or may not become strict. And furthermore, I don't know what kind of mathematics can you possibly use uh, to figure out e even that question. So if the inequality is strict in the limit or non-strict. Uh, let alone if 0.5 is the best. Or, um. so, uh, yes? So uh, I know you have other techniques when all the entries are real. Yes, I'll do it right now. Oh, yeah. But but what about this technique? Hmm? What about this technique? Does this? It, it's built on this one. Oh. So, Okay. So other remarks. So now I'm going to erase uh, theorem one and theorem two and put theorem three and theorem four. Right. Theorem three. Uh, theorem three says that theorem three says that I can allow sort of greater range for real parts of AIJ, provided I pinch the uh, the imaginary parts. So. Right, so fix some delta uh, uh, between 0 and 1. And the interesting case is not of a small delta, but the one close to 1. So, and uh, let A J be a complex matrix. such that uh, the, the real parts of the entries are within delta from 1, uh, but the imaginary parts are pinched. Something like that will do. So for all i, j, so interesting case, when delta is close to 1, right? So then um, the permanent is not 0. Uh, from that, I'll deduce uh, uh, theorem 4. Uh, which says the following, so fix uh, zero, a uh, fixed delta between zero and one. Again, the interesting case goes to one. Uh, then for any epsilon, uh, any 
Ah, let's make it less than one. Uh, any n, uh, there is a polynomial. P in the entries of an n by n matrix. Uh, J such that uh, the uh, degree is still logarithmic. Again, the implied constant in O, o notation is absolute. And uh, uh, the log of the permanent uh, approximated by that polynomial uh, with an epsilon uh, provided the entries are real and are in between, um, I guess uh, I should say 1 minus delta and 1 plus delta, right? So, one minus one plus delta, one minus delta. So if I draw a range for uh, possible entries, so they, they kind of approach arbitrarily close to zero, but fixed distance from zero, like between point one and I don't know, one. So what, what it basically says is that the matrix was um, a positive entries where the ratio between the smallest and the largest is bounded away by, is bounded from above by an absolute constant. So then it's approximable. Right. So the big O in the degree is one over oh, 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 oh. delta? Oh, I wish. So uh, it's more like this. Yeah, so it explodes. Yeah. Right. But I said fix, right? So uh, that's a, I wanted to sweep that under the rug, but you <laughs> brought it up. So. so let it be known that it badly depends on delta. Right. So, okay, so any objections to this? And I'm going to uh, explain the connection as I erase uh, this one. So that's a realization of this promise that the domain doesn't have to be circular. So what I do, I still define this polynomial. Uh, but now, I don't know if it's non-zero in a disk, but what I do know, it's non-zero in a neighborhood. Zero one interval. So the picture looks as follows zero one, and no zeros here. I'm prepared to deal with the disk, but how do I d deal with uh, uh, with a domain that's not a round. So what I do, I just squeeze a round domain there. So uh, construct, and that's kind of an exercise with a hint that you have. Construct an auxiliary <coughs> polynomial of not a totally large degree, P of z, uh, such that Uh, it maps 0 to 0, 1 to 1, 
and it maps the disk of some radius, hmm. some radius beta greater than one. So it maps the disk. Um, inside the neighborhood. And I can do that. Uh, this beta will not be great, so beta will be one plus really, really small number, e to the O of one over delta. And you can show that you cannot do better. Uh, that's a homework exercise. It uses Schwartz lemma. So that's the best you can do, actually, under the circumstances. So and then apply. So let, let me draw a disk here so that um, in the map. And then apply. Uh, the lemma that's oh, still there, I'll put it in blue. Uh, to the polynomial, to the composition, to g of c of z. So uh, what uh, what does it buy you? It buys you. It gives you a polynomial that's currently non-zero in a disk of a radius greater than one. You still want the value of this polynomial at one, right? Because this well, auxiliary polynomial maps one to one. Can you compute all the necessary derivatives at zero? Yes, you can, because this polynomial maps zero to zero. And therefore, if you look at the composition, so to compute like the case coefficient, the case derivative at zero, you need to know only the first k coefficients of this. So you cannot get lower degree terms from a high degree because if you have zero is zero. Right. So uh -huh. in this approach you are transforming this domain to the previous Right, uh, right. This is there a different approach where you you have the strip and then you put a, a sequence of disks along the Yes, strip. that's what Eldar Meherban did. And that was noble. Uh, and I'll show you an example saying that this one is better. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, 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 so try to pay by disk is the first impulse, right? Which, in my considered opinion, should be fought. <laughs> you should really squeeze things. Yeah. Unleash the power of com um, complex analysis right here, right? So, squeezing domains, right? OK, so uh, so let's see. So I still have like, oh, we're doing with time. Five minutes, right, till the first break. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, so let, 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 let me just make my case why looking at homomorphic maps is a good idea. Right. So basically, what we are after, um, so let me erase something. So, right. So what we are after. Uh, we have the following situation. So we have zero where uh, things are easy. We have one there. That's what we want. In principle, we could have uh, some complicated path leading zero to one. And what we know is that there is some neighborhood 
where the polynomial is non-zero uh, for all uh, z in the neighborhood. Then we can interpolate, right? Can interpolate just like we did here. And uh, it's pretty clear that the larger the neighborhood we have, uh, well, the larger disk we can squeeze. So the larger the better. So here we have one extreme example where the neighborhood is just a tiny little neighborhood of zero one interval. Here, here's another good example, extreme on the other side. So suppose that we know that all roots are real and negative. So, and suppose we know that this distance is delta, right? So real rooted thing. And that connection with our other topics of this workshop. Then the neighborhood we can take is just the whole plane without that negative ray. So then the disk we can choose <coughs> we can choose beta equal one plus one over square root of this distance. And that's done. Uh, how it's done? It's done. Uh, it's, uh, it's an exercise. There is a rational map which does that. And the lemma applies to rational maps just as well as polynomial. So what does it buy you? So for example, let's look at the matching polynomial where you thought that nothing new can be really said about. Right. So matching polynomial. So uh, it was introduced in several shapes and sizes. And the one I like is, was introduced by Alistair yesterday. So we have a graph. <coughs> and uh, the matching polynomial, the sum from k equals 0 to, say, half of the number of vertices, m sub k of g, that's um, uh, matchings with k, the number of matchings with k edges. I'll lit up a minute or two from the exercises. Okay. Yeah. Times z to the k, right? And the Hamann Lieb theorem, which was stated here a number of times. says that the roots are real and uh, uh, they do not exceed one, a negative 1 over 4 delta minus 1. The delta is a max degree in this setting, right? So what this interpolation does, squeezing a really large disk into that, it gives the following which I, uh, result, which I find curious. So that uh, within uh, relative error epsilon, uh, the number, the number of matchings of all matchings. Uh, uh, which is just the value of that uh, polynomial at uh, 1. Is determined by very first few coefficients. Is determined by 
by m sub k, the number of matchings with uh, k edges for k, um, which is O of 1 over, of uh, not 1 over, uh, so square root of the largest degree times the log of the number of vertices divided by epsilon. So if you tell me all these numbers up to roughly log of the number of vertices and uh, um, square root of the largest degree, I can tell you with an error epsilon the number of all matchings. I can tell you efficiently if you tell me these numbers. And uh, this square root of delta, I believe, is the same square root of delta which appears in the correlation decay approach of uh, Gmarnik, Katz, Titali, that paper. So, and uh, my reason for the square root here is because when you have such a huge neighborhood, you can uh, really squeeze the large disk into it. So I do believe that this is the best you can do, although I don't have a proof. Uh, but I do believe that the proof can be, as Lawrence Albuquerque says, can be found if you pay a bit and <laughs> allocate some some time for that, right? So it, it's doable, I believe. Yeah, I believe that it's the best. So, so what happens here, because the neighborhood is so huge, so the this map of the disk, so if it opens up like a, like a fan <laughs> and goes around this negative ray, so it covers everything but the negative ray. So, and I don't think you can do it by paving. So my uh, belief that by paving you don't get square root, you just get one of those. Because from a paving point of view, it doesn't matter whether roots are real or they just lie in the uh, left uh, half plane. But from a sort of conformal point of view, it matters because you can do things. There is a lot of room. OK, so that's probably a good time to pause. <laughs> so remarkable, ah, we have five minutes break. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, OK, OK, yeah.